Hello BookTube! Some of you will know, if you've been watching this channel for a long time, that there is a great used bookstore uh, in the heart of downtown Boston called the Brattle Bookshop. They're very old. They have antique and collectible first edition, rare editions up on the third floor, but the first two floors are all just a great, packed, busy, used bookstore. Double stack shelves, wonderful arrangement of stuff, wonderful assortment, a whole kids section, which not, not every used bookstore has. Uh, and also a sale lot next door that is huge. It's not a couple of wheelbarrows full of sale books that are left out in the rain. It's thousands and thousands of books uh, that are arranged in no way at all other than price. One dollar, three dollars, and five dollars. Uh, and I love the Brattle Bookshop so much that I try to get there at least a couple of times a year. And I made a September pilgrimage to the Brattle today. I went to the Brattle Bookshop first thing and uh, got a lot of books. <laughs> I, I got a lot of books for a few other people, set a lot of them aside to be uh, finished out, or fleshed out, or mailed out. Uh, but I got a ton of stuff for myself as well, a pile of books that I wanted to show you. <sighs> no, baby, don't go back to licking. Just don't lick me and then go back to licking. Uh, so we're just going to go through here. It's, it's a huge pile of books. We'll just go through them and then we'll make a Frida stop it. Uh, the first two things that I want to show you are mass market paperbacks. Uh, the first one is from Scribner's, and this is back when they owned the rights to everything F. Scott Fitzgerald. Back then, they did a lovely set of mass market paperbacks of everything Fitzgerald. Uh, I really enjoyed the look of them, the, the, even the stiffness of the binding seem to me to be made for long-term use, which is rare for mass market paperbacks. I got rid of all those mass market paperbacks, one after another after another. I think I kept this side of paradise the longest, but I got rid of them all eventually uh, in the great mass market paperback purge. <laughs> but I found one today that was one of my favorites. Uh, not any actual work of Fitzgerald's. It's sort of a posthumous collection. Uh, this is uh, put together by... Was it, who, who did this? Uh, uh, okay, all right, well, you're not going to tell me. Okay, you're not going to tell me. I think this might have been Arthur Misener put this together. Uh, but you're absolutely not going to tell me. Fitzgerald didn't put it together. You'd think the book would tell me. Someone else assembled this. This is called Afternoon of an Author. And it is a bunch of Fitzgerald uh, little pieces, vignettes, essays, that sort of thing. This has... Uh, I think How Never to Be Bored is in here. This, this phantom anthology that was put together by no one at all. I think this was Arthur Misner who put this together. Uh, okay, if you don't have a table of contents, then I'm going to throw you in the garbage. No, there we go. Okay. Uh, how to Live on Practically Nothing a Year. Uh, how to Waste Material, Notes on My Generation. Ten Years in the Advertising Business. Uh, one Trip Abroad. There's, there's something in here... Uh, the Afternoon of an Author, that's a weird diary entry type thing. Uh, author's House. Lots and lots of interesting bits and pieces that I don't have anywhere else. Uh, I don't think I have anywhere else. So when I saw this, not only did it remind me of how much I used to like these old Scribner paperbacks, uh, but it's also the one that I would want. Uh, then this next one is uh, perhaps the least lucky novel in the history of novels. <laughs> this is a, a historical novel by Stephen Marlowe. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to risk saying whether or not Stephen Marlowe is still alive, but uh, Stephen Marlowe, like many people in this Brattle book hall, wrote under a great number of pseudonyms. Such a shameful practice. Who writes under pseudonyms? I ask you. But anyway. <laughs> but he also wrote, he wrote under his own name a couple of really good books. He wrote a, a novel about Christopher Columbus that is both heartbreaking and genuinely funny. Uh, and he wrote an earlier novel about Xenophon and the Ten Thousand about the, the march up country. And it's called The Shining. <laughs> it's just about as unlucky as it gets. Uh, you, if you Google or, you know, look on Amazon or Goodreads for this book, good luck finding it amidst the 50,000 editions of a much worse novel by the same name. And you might think, well, wait a minute, you don't usually keep the price tags on your Brattle books. And you're right, I don't. And I don't like it when you do, either. When I look at used book halls from all of you, and I see tags all over these things. Ugh, get them off. 
<laughs> get them off there. Uh, but in this case, I wanted to keep the tags because one is the Brattle Bookshop, one dollar, and the other is Avenue Victor Hugo, one dollar and ninety cents. So this gives you a little journey of this book. This thing, this paperback, uh, came out um, uh, in 1963. This Cardinal edition came out in 1965. Sooner or later, somewhere down the line, that ended up at Avenue Victor Hugo, which was a great used bookstore in Boston. It's been gone for a long, long time. I used to go there every every week, at least once a week. Uh, in addition to the Brattle and a handful of other great used bookstores that are all gone, except the Brattle. Uh, I used, the Avenue Victor Hugo used to be a mainstay of mine. There was a record store right across the street. There was a great comic shop right up the street. Uh, there was a great Chinese food restaurant that was right there. It was a, it was a, and Avenue Victor Hugo was a big, teeming used bookstore, just full of stuff, crammed full of stuff. Uh, and this book made it there. Then it made it out of there. Someone bought it for $1.90, maybe read it. It looks like it's been read a few times. And then eventually it made its way to the Brattle. And now it's, it's made its way to me. <laughs> this is, I haven't reread this in forever. It's a really good historical novel in the ancient Greek world. Also very funny. It's, it's got far more somber things to describe, but it is, uh, this is an author who knows when to lighten the mood and is able to do so. Uh, then we'll do, uh, let's see here, two more paperbacks. I found a lovely trade paperback of this thing. I read this one. It was out in hardcover. It had an ugly cover, and I thought no more of it. I loved it. I, it's, it's a great Sherlock Holmes pastiche novel, one of the best. I had no idea that it had ever been reprinted in such a pretty trade paperback. This is Sherlock in Love by Sarah Gina Naslin, Sina Gina Naslin, who went on to write Ahab and Ahab's Wife that sold a gajillion copies, just a gajillion copies, Book of the Month Club, book clubs all over the country, all over the world, every single library, anywhere. But this was before then. And this is a Sherlock Holmes pastiche novel that is really, really good. I imagine that the same person got rid of this that got rid of that John Watson thriller that we saw the other day, uh, also from the Brown. But this is a, a completely different thing than an ordinary, adventurous Sherlock Holmes pastiche novel. It has adventure in it, but it's far more uh, thoughtful and even surreal at times. I love it, and I haven't read it. When did this come out? Uh, I read this when it first came out. I was working in a bookstore. It must have been the 90s. 1993. I read this then. I haven't read it since. Uh, so I can't wait to give that really good Sherlock Holmes pastiche novel another try. And then this, this next trade paperback I don't think is an American product. Uh... I wonder if uh, if this will actually. Oh, it is this is a penguin? It's a penguin trade paperback, but it's a, an Indian penguin trade paperback. It says right on the cover for sale in the Indian subcontinent and Singapore only. <laughs> I didn't notice that when I grabbed it. No wonder I've never seen it before. Wow, talk about another journey of a book. Somebody had to buy this there, maybe on a plane trip over here, and then dump it at the Brattle. This is uh, R.K. Narayan. The great writer R.K. Narayan, who I absolutely love. And I love him as everybody else does for his Malgudi tales. His tales of uh, now for uh, now lost India. And this is a collection, The World of Malgudi. Which has uh, Mr. Sampat, the financial experts, a painter of signs, and a tiger for Malgudi. Uh, and this is an Indian trade paperback. Boy, oh boy, I did not notice that. That makes it all the more precious. Fantastic. I don't have a lot of this author. I saw the road a lot of stuff, and I love it all. Uh, this one, this collection has A Painter of Signs, which is one of his better books. Uh, a Vendor of Sweets is not in here. That's another one that's really great, but I, I'll take whatever I can get. I don't know off the top of my head uh, whether or not Penguin India made more volumes like this. Maybe they did. Maybe, maybe this isn't the only one. Uh, wow, that is just incredible. It's got a price in rupees on the back. That is amazing. Okay, well, I didn't know that. Great, fantastic. I have almost nothing by this author. He should be entirely in Penguin Black Spine Classics. Not just for uh, the Indian subcontinent and Singapore, but for the whole world. He should be. He's that great. But, uh, but now I have this, anyway. Uh, then we have uh, the hardcovers, which were the devil's own business to carry around. I really do miss the days when I had muscular teenagers as unpaid laborers to carry all my stuff around. 
no, I don't anymore. I had to, I had to carry all this stuff myself. Uh, this next one is 100 years old. This is Cape Cod, New and Old by Agnes Edwards. It's in really rotten shape. I got it just because sometimes if you prime the pump at the brattle, you're happy that you did. Sometimes if you find a book that's in crappy shape and you get it, the Brattle Gods will find you a good shape copy of that same book. If you show the earnestness. This has uh, illustrations all throughout uh, by, I want to make sure I get it, Lewis Rule. There are, there are these lovely uh, pencil sketch illustrations all throughout. Uh, and this, yeah, there are also spot illustrations. There's a clapboard house right on the road there. This, and this is from uh, the early part of the 20th century, 1918, something like that, 1918. And this is, uh, I've, always, I've always sort of joked that the number one thing that people who love Cape Cod love to do is say that it isn't what it used to be. <laughs> and they've been saying that for 400 years. 400 years of people saying, well, I suppose the old cape is probably gone. Oh, wasn't it wonderful, though? <laughs> People still do that. Still. There was just a... There, there have been... There's, you can rely upon every five years there will be a book by somebody on the Cape or the Vineyard or Nantucket saying, boy, things aren't what they used to be. <laughs> and you go back 100 years and, and Agnes, is, Agnes Edwards is saying that exact same thing. But it's lovely. It's done in a lovely way. Uh, and once you once you acknowledge that uh, that people have always been saying that about the Cape, it takes on a kind of uh, it takes on a kind of wistfulness of its own. Uh, like for instance, at the beginning of her book, she write, has a little chapter called "The Lost Road." There was once, as she describes it very aptly, a sandy road between Boston and Cape Cod. Uh, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, Cape Cod is. Uh, if Massachusetts, the state, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the greatest state in the Union, is a rectangle, then there's a hook extending off the edge of it into the ocean. And that hook of land is Cape Cod. Um, and I love it. I love it. Uh, just, I love it dearly. It's one of my favorite places on Earth. Uh, and when, when she's writing about that old Cape Road, which has changed, she, the first chapter of the book hits this note right away, that the, that, that road has changed, and it no longer has stables along the route for men you know who were riding from boston on horseback instead there's a railroad there are cars there are automobiles that have made suddenly put the the cape within an hour or two to drive of boston uh, so there's a lot more people and she ends it by saying the old road to the cape is lost and with it much of the dust both of reality and romance but a new road has opened bringing every year hundreds and hundreds of automobiles and literally thousands of men and women who would otherwise never breathe the balmy air or see those windswept moors. Surely we old Cape Codders must and do greet them hospitably. It is for their special welcoming that this little book was written. And if, perhaps, it is touched too fondly by the spirit of reminiscence, that fault may be forgiven by the newcomers and may endear it more to those who are not strangers to Cape Cod. Now, I, I, I tease, but I am guilty of the same thing myself. I remember when the Cape was very different from what it is today, and I loved it. The, the key thing is that uh, uh, most very old Cape Codders, although they will instantly launch on the theme of how the Cape isn't what it used to be, uh, they still love it. It doesn't dim their love at all. They don't say it's not what it used to be and I'm leaving. No one ever says that. Uh, so I got this old thing. I have a whole shelf of old Cape Cod books. I love them all. Uh, then this next one is a uh, Everyman Library hardcover. These, this design is quite nice. I really like this design, so I grab it when I see something that I want. And this is the complete novels of Flann O'Brien. Uh, a great Irish author who flourished at the same time as uh, as James Joyce and uh, a prolific columnist named Miles Nagopoulin. <laughs> he flourished right at the same time. And this has all of his famous novels. Uh, at Swim Two Birds, uh, uh, you've got uh, The Third Policeman, uh, The Dalkey Archives, uh, the Hard Life, which is an odd book for Flann O'Brien, not 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 what you'd expect, and the Poor Mouth, and the Poor Mouth is, in my opinion, his funniest book, but also his least accessible, Savage, but so totally Irish that I honestly do believe that despite whoever uh, translates it, I, I honestly do believe that it's not translatable, uh, but 
a lot of the other stuff is, and this is a lovely thing. These these volumes are lovely. They are uh, they have this uh, the cloth bookmark at the bottom there, and they they all look uniform like that. And I when I saw this at the Brattle, I realized that I didn't have any Flann O'Brien. I don't have any Flann O'Brien, uh, so uh, I grabbed it, and I think I will put it to use. One of the one of the uh, the besetting questions that I always am faced with when I make a big buy of books at the Brattle is when we read these things because most of the reading that I do is new releases. That's that's a huge chunk of my time, uh, but I like to set aside in any Brattle book haul there will be a couple of books that will really pull at me more than any of the others for they'll all get read eventually. But th this is something I'm going to keep. Not all of these things are things that I will keep, but this is something I'm going to keep. And I think I want to reread the Dalkey Archive before I put this on the shelf and say, you know, good night forever. <laughs> before I put it on the shelf and wait until the next time I want to read at Swim Two Birds, I think I want to read the Dalkey Archive all over again. Uh, so, and this is in perfect condition. It was lovely, so I grabbed it. Uh, then this next one, uh, the Brattle gives me an opportunity to get things like this. This is a book that I got an advanced copy of it from the publisher, which is Hachette Books. Uh, and I read it. I really liked it. I reviewed it for the Christian Science Monitor, uh, and never got the hardcover. And I, if it has a paperback, I've never seen the paperback. I'm sure that I blurred on the paperback, uh, but I, I've never seen it. And I saw, I found the hardcover today, uh, and I want it. The, the hardcover has illustrations. It has, you know, the the bibliography at the end it has all the the folder all that the advanced copy doesn't have i held on to the advanced copy because i didn't want to not have the book some publishers just don't they they either neglect to send me the hardcover or they just don't want to uh, but this is by michael blandon and it is called north by shakespeare and it's the michael blandon tells the story in here of oh well, here let me let me tell you about it uh acclaimed author uh michael blandon see this is a story within a story he's telling you the story of a guy who has a theory about Shakespearean authorship. So it's not Michael Blandick's theory. Uh, he presents the twinning narratives of the renegade scholar Dennis McCarthy, called the Steve Jobs of the Shakespeare community, and Sir Thomas North, an Elizabethan courier, courtier whom McCarthy believes to be the undiscovered source of Shakespeare's plays. For the last 15 years, McCarthy has obsessively pursued the true origin of Shakespeare's works. Using plagiarism software, he has, been, he has found direct links between Hamlet, Macbeth, Romeo and Juliet, and other plays, and North's published and unpublished writings, as well as Shakespearean plot lines seemingly lifted straight from North's colorful life. Uh, unlike those who believe someone else secretly wrote Shakespeare's work, McCarthy proposes a wholly original explanation. Shakespeare wrote the plays, but he adapted them from source plays written by North decades before. Many of them, he believes, were penned on the, belief, on the behalf of North's patron Robert Dudley in his effort to woo Queen Elizabeth. That bold theory addresses many lingering mysteries about the Bard with compelling new evidence, including a newly discovered journal of North's travels through France and Italy filled with locations and details appearing in Shakespeare's plays. And this is this has a twofold charm. Because on the one hand, you're learning about McCarthy and why he comes increasingly to believe that he's onto something. And on the other hand, you have Blanding, Blanding telling that story. Uh, and the combination really worked for me. This is a Shakespeare book to have. Very much so. And now I finally can, can put my uh, my battered review copy to rest. <laughs> I now have the hardcover, which has the uh, the requisite inset of uh, illustrations. There is Dennis McCarthy and a whole bunch of other, you know, a whole bunch of other pictures to give you the scene, to give you to set the scene for uh, for the Shakespearean times. Uh, then this next one, <sighs> this next one I did not expect at all. I read some of these things, uh, but never expected that they were in a book. Uh, and they are. This is Thomas Boylston Adams, and those of you who uh, <laughs> those of you who are at all familiar with Boston will know that a name Thomas Boylston Adams is going to be a very Bostonian thing. Uh, and it's true. This is a collection called the, A New Nation, and it collects a whole bunch of Boston Globe columns by Thomas Boylston Adams over over a long, long period of time on founding fathers, uh, founding uh, Puritans, the. Uh, uh, Later figures like Calvin Coolidge or uh, uh, Herbert Hoover, I think, might be in here. Uh, who who we got here? Uh, evacuation of Boston, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, Nixon. It goes as late as Nixon. Fantastic. Uh, and uh, 
just carries they're all they're a whole bunch probably 30 or 40 things in here because they were little newspaper things they were little newspaper problems but here they are all collected there'll be a huge amount in here that i haven't read oh baby this whole side is covered how are you going to get down there give it a try go nice and slow how are you going to do that Oh no, baby! You can't stop. No, you have no fear. You have to. You have, there. You go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, let's just move on. Uh, this next book is going to go on the bookcase about books, about books, books about reading, collected essays, collected reviews. I read this thing. It's from Princeton University Press, I think. Yes. No, Yale. I read this thing uh, when it first came out. Um, let's, let's go down the line here. Let's just figure out what this is. I read it and loved it back in two thousand one. I got rid of it probably in a move, a house move, or something or other than that. And I found another copy today. I'm so happy. This will be a reread fairly soon. I don't know about this weekend, but fairly soon. This is by H.J. Jackson, and it is Marginalia. It's a book about writing in books. <laughs> Not writing books, but writing in books. And it's terrific. Absolutely terrific. Takes you through a thousand different case studies. Who does what and when going back a thousand years or more. Uh, it just it, it is the book you want on marginalia. It really is, and it's all told wonderfully. I couldn't help but notice uh, in this copy that I got, there is a program uh, for Harvard University for the the uh, conferring of an honorary degree on Winston Churchill. <laughs> I don't know what this is doing in there. This is the program. The hymns, the speakers, all this sort of stuff. I have no idea. No idea. It's kind of a weird thing to use for a bookmark, but since it's in the book, I will. Uh, I uh, am guilty of marginalia. I've written a whole Library of Congress worth of marginalia in my life. As a reader, I do it all the time. I guarantee you I will load this book with marginalia. I seem to remember from 2001 that this got a lot of fun critical attention. I don't have any of those pieces, I'm sure. Back then, in 2001, I probably kept them in a filing cabinet. I probably kept them all together in a filing cabinet arranged by year of publication. Totally useless. I, I did that forever and ever for decades. I never once went back and looked in any of those files. Finally, I just got rid of them and all the bric-a-brac and also the filing cabinet, which had to be lugged out to the sidewalk. Uh, I don't think I kept any of those reviews because I didn't have the book at the time. My reviews now go in their books. They don't go anywhere else. They go in the book where I know exactly where to find them. I will make a new home for this. I will, I will heavily annotate it. Uh, then this next one is one that I've seen at the Brattle all the time. You see it in used bookstores a lot and yard sales and whatnot. But I saw it today and realized it's really good. It's, it's really enjoyable stuff if you like this sort of thing. And I do. Uh, so I grabbed it. Uh, this is Otto Friedrich and this is his Decline and Fall. This is he was an editor at Saturday Evening Post right until it ended. Uh, so right after the peak of its heyday, all the way to its end. And he wrote a book about what that was like. The inter-office politics, all the people, all the literary stars that came and went. Because uh, the Saturday Evening Post, I think, is a version of it is still published. I think. Uh, but f either way, if you are coming at it from a present-day lens, you have no idea how popular it once was. Uh, what a major gig it was. I, I think Friedrich moved on to either Time or Newsweek back when they were a big deal and stayed with them. I, I think it was Time magazine. He stayed for a long time, wrote a lot for them. Uh, but he got a lot of great critical attention for this book when it came out in uh, of the 19, late 1970s. Is that right? 1970. This came out in 1970. He got a, a lot. This got a lot of critical response, and I remember it being really good to read. And I love this sort of thing. Insider accounts of of journals or magazines, stuff like this. I loved. Uh, uh, what was her? What's her name? Oh my God, I'm blanking on her name. I'm blanking on the title too. There was a book that just a couple of years ago about the the very earliest years of Virago Press that was wonderful. It was also, of course, the best selling example of this kind imaginable, which is Brendan Gill's book here at the New Yorker, which for all its waspy venom is tremendously enjoyable. It's a tremendously enjoyable book. Uh, and this is of the same type of thing, only about a magazine that really, you know, the New Yorker still continues. I got my new issue today. Uh, then these next two are an example of a phenomenon that happens at the Brattle, and that, uh, that I've mentioned many times, and that is second chances. You 
the stock at the Brattle is changing all the time. So I'm not talking about a second chance where you leave something there one day, you go back next month or next year and it's there and you get it because you regretted leaving it there. That won't happen at the Brattle. That's way too much turnover. You'd be lucky if something stays for a few days. I was lucky actually this week that something I wanted stayed for a day. So I was able to, you know, snap it up on second thought. But many's the time when that doesn't happen. Many's the time. Uh, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about second chances from my professional career or even my career as a reader. Well, I, where I will read something the first time and think of it a bit, estimate it a bit, but then not think much more of it and get rid of it. Uh, sometimes even, you know, uh, shame of shame, I will read it, I will think not that much of it, I will write a review of it, and then I will get rid of it. <laughs> and uh, then it sticks with me. It just sticks in my mind and keeps making me either rebuy it or rethink about it. And I found two of those today that I am going to keep. I'm going to keep these volumes until I make my final piece with these things. One of which will be easier than the other. This this one, uh, this this first one is a big novel. Uh, it's the author's big novel, the big novel he was always threatening to write, the big novel that everyone wanted to see him write. The author is Felice Picano. This is for the gays. You've got to have something for the gays. And this is like people in history. Uh, with... Uh, who is that classic cover artwork? Steve Walker. If you don't know the gay artwork of Steve Walker, uh, it might be worth a Google <laughs> because it's uh, emblematic of a certain time. Uh, Steve Walker's artwork is emblematic of a certain time and a certain wish fulfillment in gay life. He was, he was drawing uh, amazing sort of tug at your heartstrings pictures at a time when gay life was pretty ugly. So I, a lot of people really wanted original frame portraits, original frame prints. A lot of people wanted his artwork on, their, on the covers of their books. <laughs> a, few, a few writers that I know, but had, wanted his, his stuff on the covers of their books. Uh, and this is a typical Steve Walker painting. All of the men in his paintings are gorgeous. They're all young, they're all muscular, they're all gorgeous. And they're often daydreaming about finding the right person. And you, as the viewer, are the right person. So there's a little bit of uh, thirst trap clickbait long before there was an internet. You hear you have these three improbably gorgeous guys who are all wistfully looking for someone. And little do they know that they are mere inches away from each other. <laughs> but this is Felice Picano's great big novel. He's written a lot of other novels. He's really, really good. Really good. And this book is really good. But I have had this paperback and hardcover, I don't know, probably four times, five times, and I always get rid of it, and I don't know why. Always it ends up striking me as somehow unsatisfactory, somehow not worth the bother to keep. But it's not that much bother to keep it. I keep lots of things. <laughs> and I'm going to read this again. I don't know if this will be as quick as some of the other things on this list. I'm, I'm itching to read Flann O'Brien. I'm itching to get at the Dalkey Archives and read it again. But And a couple of these other things, I, I will I will read in them, bits and pieces of them. This thing, though, maybe a whole read-through. Maybe a, a pencil-in-hand, slow, careful, thoughtful read-through to sort of nail down what I actually think about this book. I think I think the, the, the easiest explanation for why this has never been a completely solid, oh, yes, I will keep that forever, I don't need to go through multiple copies of this thing, is because it's not 100% successful. But what is 100% successful? The Dalkey Archive is not 100% successful. What is? That's no good reason. I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that over the years since this came out, this came out in what, 1991? Something like that, I want to say. 1995. Uh, in the years since, uh, since this book has been out, I have, I guess it's safe to say, grappled with it. There are two big gay novels like people in history, and how long has this been going on? And I have grappled with both of them. And I guess maybe I always will. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. But I, I, I got it. I intend to keep it this time. I intend to hold on to it. Uh, and then the next, the next second chance, this is a far more straightforward thing. I just think I didn't really see uh, how good this was, which is kind of strange because the author is known to me. This is Through the Eye of the Needle uh, by Peter Brown. And it is about uh, wealth, the fall of Rome, and the making of Christianity in the West. Uh, and it, it, one of the very smallest things that it deals with, still very, very interesting thing, 
is the way Christianity ingratiated itself to the wealthy echelons of Roman society, which allowed it to propagate and allowed it to survive. Uh, but there are lots of other things in here, not only that, but also how Christianity looks at wealth and how it should look at wealth. Historically, what's grounded were those ideas. It's a major work of, of uh, Roman history, of Christian history, Christianity history. I read it, and I think I even reviewed it when it came out. This was, this was before we started talking to each other, but not so long ago. Yeah, 2012. I'm almost certain there's a review by me out there of this that did not fully appreciate how great it is it is so uh, it's been sticking in my mind consistently since then so i will give it a reread <laughs> i will give it a, a careful reread with no review deadline over my head just to see what's in it to see how much is in it it's got a hundred pages of close pack single page typing notes that should have been a clue <laughs> but and then the last thing for this brattle trip uh is Another thing that the Brattle does where you, I guess it's a second chance. I had this thing once upon a time. And when it comes to a canonical work or a, a, a well-known work of some kind, you often think, I often think, well, I know I love the work, but here's the exact form that I want the work in. I know that I love the work, but there's no sense getting some other form. I want it in this form. I want this edition. That's the edition that I want to use, not to keep and hoard somewhere under glass, but to use, that's the one I want. Um, and I found, I found one of those today and grabbed it immediately. The book is uh, Vasari's Lives of the Artists. Uh, it's called, we call it His Lives of the Artists. It's a long mouthful of a title in, in the original. Uh, but Vasari wrote this gi gi gigantic collection of brief biographies of artists, painters, sculptors, architects, and Typically, what has been done to Vasari's Lives of the Artists is the same thing has been done to Plutarch's Parallel Lives. People have gone into it with a hammer and pick and sort of mined out the names that have survived over time and left the others behind. So, so here is Vasari, like Penguin or Oxford or whatever. It'll be Vasari's Lives of the Artists, but only the artists you've heard of. <laughs> now, I don't know why we treat books like that, but I don't want that. And look what I found. Another Everyman's Library. I found their two-volume box set of the complete, unabridged Vasari's Lives of the Artists. How absolutely incredible. Just absolutely incredible to find this. Uh, I had this once upon a time. I'm pretty sure that this box set is not mine. Uh, I haven't double-checked to make sure. I know where to look if it is, but I don't think I would ever put a, a divider between the two volumes to stop them from rubbing against each other. I have had enough time getting volumes out of box sets anyway without adding something to the width of the thing. But this is the whole of, the, of Vasari's Lives of the Artists. And that is what I want. And it's also a box set, which I deeply love. Because box sets don't need shelf space. <laughs> box sets are their own unit. I can put this on the floor, and boom, I have found space for it. <laughs> I can put it anywhere. I can make it a bookend, which they are excellent for. This thing weighs a ton as I know well, since I had to get it back here, because I don't have muscular weightlifters anymore. Uh, these things act as bookends, too. It just, I, this is going to be an absolute del delight. An absolute delight. When did this... Uh, when did this edition come out? Uh, these are just so... Oh, my God. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here. <laughs> Help us. Uh, these, this edition... Are you going to tell me when you came out? Um, uh, when did this happen? 1996. This came out in 1996. And when I got this originally, uh, paid a, a <laughs> Mark Richardson was having flashbacks. I paid a pretty penny for it. Uh, and when I got it originally, I decided to just read it straight through from beginning to end. And I did. Uh, so that's another reason why I think this isn't my original copy, because my, my original box set did not. This one has just a nick right up there. But my original box set looked pretty bad. The books themselves did. Uh, but I think this time I will go at uh, the very most minor author, the very most minor subjects. I'll avoid Leonardo or Donatello or whatever. I'll avoid them completely and just stick to, uh, to the minor lives this time around. Fantastic, though, just to have this. Just great. Uh, and that is it. <laughs> that was a brattle haul.
I don't know that I can do a Steve Pyramid here. We'll give it a try. Through the Eye of the Needle, uh, Peter Brown, a really searching look at classical Rome. Uh, like People in History by Felice Picano. Got to have something for the gays. Uh, Decline and Fall, Otto Friedrich's great book about the Saturday Evening Post, his old employer. Marginalia, about writing in books. Uh, a New Nation uh, by Thomas Boylston Adams, little vignettes of American history. North by Shakespeare, uh, Michael Blanding's story of uh, really convincing theory about Shakespearean collaboration. Uh, the complete novels of Flann O'Brien in an Everyman classic, fantastic, great. Uh, Cape Cod, new and old, and a battered old copy there. The world of Malgudi, in an Indian subcontinent penguin trade paperback. Uh, Sherlock in Love, in this delightful uh, trade edition. Uh, the Shining, <laughs> The Shining. Do you want to get sued? <laughs> By Stephen Marlowe. Uh, afternoon of an author, all little bits and pieces of. Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and finally, uh, Vasari's Lives of the Artists, in an Everyman box set. Never going to let this go again. Uh, and that is it. That is long enough. Thank you very much. That was my, uh, my November 2022 Brattle trip. I like to go a few times a year to the Brattle. It's always a big special occasion. Who knows when I'll be there again. Uh, maybe sometime in 2023? <laughs> I'll take you along when it happens. <laughs> Thank you, Book 2.